Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot. Guarding it in Mid-South, I'm Chris Cooper. If they are happy, shrubs can get large and out of hand. Today we will learn how to prune them. Also, snakes are beneficial in the garden, but running into the wrong one can ruin your day. That's just ahead on the Family Plot. Guarding it in Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Joellen Diamond. Joellen is the Director of Landscape at the University of Memphis, and Andy Williams from Lichterman Nature Center will be joining me later. Hi, Joellen. Hi. Why do we prune? Pr well, you know, <laughs> pruning is the removal of a plant, okay. part of a plant. Okay. And pruning, there are several reasons why you should prune. The number one is probably safety. Okay. You know, shrubs get too big around their house mm -hmm. and you want to get them lower so right. you can either see in or out your windows and, and just keeping them in on, on the sidewalks or the driveway, trying to keep them out of the way of your vehicle or Long pedestrians. Or, yeah, if you're Long cutting grass. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, you, you know, there's a lot of reasons to prune. Okay. Um, safety is the number one. Safety. Uh, but they're also for the health of the plant. You know, if a, t a tight plant doesn't have any air circulation in it, you can prune to make it more airy so that it has better light and um, air circulation to keep diseases and pests away. Okay. Uh, another one is for flower and fruit production. Mm. Think about an apple tree. You know, it's got tons of little apples on it. Well, you don't want a whole bunch of little apples. You'd rather have just a few or bigger apples. Right. So you'd have to take some of those off. And of course, roses, you know, yes. rosarians, they, they yes. really prune hard and they keep the, just one bud on each stem to get those huge flower buds. Yeah. So um, there's lots of reasons to, to prune. Of course, there's specialized pruning like bonsai, uh, that's espalier, real specialized. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, but that's a whole other yeah. subject. Yeah. We're just talking about pruning around your house. Okay. Now, there are some several tools that you can use to do that. This is probably the number one used and, uh, and and bought item for pruning. And I have this wherever I go. I uh, it, it's use it for a lot of pruning reasons. Um, this will prune up to three-fourths of an inch okay. in diameter. When you want something larger, you are going to have to go to what they call a lopper. Okay. And this will get up to one and a half inch diameter branches. Uh, anything larger than that, then you really no, need. Okay. Then you there really you it, it's anything larger than that, and you really need a pruning saw. Now I like these because they are close up, and the blade is away from you, and you simply uh, open it. There it goes. And it locks. It's nice. And pruning saws have a wide set, sharp teeth, and they cut unlike other saws on the pull. Hmm. So when you get next to a branch and you pull, that's how you cut it. Gotcha. It cuts on the, the pull. Um, and this is up to maybe one, two and a half, three inches. Anything larger than that, then I really suggest you get someone who knows what they're doing, like a certified <laughs> arborist right. to prune your trees. These are the only hand pruners that I have. And I, these you see, I look very nice because I rarely use them. Okay. Um, nice. oh, if nothing else, uh, make sure your tools are sharp. So always get uh, uh, a file and make sure your, your tools are sharp, they're clean, they're oiled so that they work well. There is another pruning <laughs> item that a lot of people like to use and this is a pruning shear. Um, shearing plants is not a healthy way to keep your plants looking good because they force a lot of growth so that the interior of the plant does not have leaves. So like this one isn't sheared. And you can see there's leaves clear down right. in the plant. And that's what you want to get air and light movement into your plant. Shearing stops that. And a lot of sheared plants end up with a lot of pests and diseases mm -hmm. because of that. So it's not as a healthy way to prune, but people still use this. Yeah. Um, they do. Uh, I, I don't, there's all kinds of hand shears, but I rarely use these, if ever. <laughs> 
So that's that. Okay. Some of the things that you're going to have to know about a plant is going to help you prune it better. Okay. The first thing is all, excuse me, <laughs> all branches have what they call a terminal bud or an apical bud, same thing. And if you, it, it, this particular bud inhibits the growth of lateral buds. When you cut the apical bud, the lateral buds tend to break and grow. Okay because the hormone that's inhibiting them is gone. So in that way, you can learn how to give fill in a plant or give direction to a plant. If you have a lopsided plant, uh, you can cut the terminal buds on them. Okay. Lateral buds will come and fill out that side of the plant. Right, so sense. you can okay. use that to your advantage. If you look at each of these leaves, there is a bud that comes out uh, between the, the leaf uh, petiole and the stem. That's where all the buds reside. And those are points of growth, and that's where you prune to. But you'll notice these leaves face different directions. Mm -hmm. Well, then if, you, if I cut this plant right here, this leaf is growing in this direction. That means when the bud comes and breaks, it will send out a stem in this direction. So you can control the direction that your plant grows by which bud you, you leave out gotcha. and you cut up against. Right. And that is also helps you take our plants and shrubs and make them go out, out instead of and instead of in, in. Gotcha. and then that keeps light and gotcha. air movement through the plant for, to help with diseases and pests. Okay. So those are the, some of the principles that we use. And when you do cut it, we will cut a quarter of an inch in the direction that the bud is going. Okay. And because you don't want to put a whole lot of material above where the bud is. Don't cut in the middle because the plant will have to harden that off. And you don't want the plant to waste energy when something you could have cut off real quickly. You want it to put energy into the bud that's right. going to build that stem out. Okay. Makes sense. Now we're going to talk about different types of plants. Look at these. These are blooming. The best time to prune okay. any shrub, it doesn't matter what kind, any shrub that blooms is within a few weeks after it finishes blooming. Okay. That way the whole the plant has an entire year to build buds for next year's bloom. Next <laughs> thing you um, want to look at is see how the bottom of this plant is further out than the top right. of it. And so, unlike my father who used to do this all the time, he had boxwoods and he made little round circles mm -hmm. out of them. The meatballs. Drove me yeah. crazy, but he, he continued to do it. The problem is, when, if, if I did that with this plant and cut this, this part will be shaded by the top part of this plant. And it won't bloom and it'll that's why they tend to get leggy and you'll see lollipop yeah. plants is because they took away the lower limbs so that they're not getting light so azaleas and things that bloom especially you want a nice angle on the plant now you can make it rounded but make it mounded and not rounded mounded yeah mounded with with the base further away than the top okay. at an angle and this one here is getting a little tall. So again, I'm gonna find a point of growth and prune it off. And the main point of, of pruning like this is to make it look like you haven't pruned. When we get done, you'll never know I was there. You won't notice that somebody has pruned. In essence, you're hiding the cut. I think I've heard that a couple of times. Well, when, you're, you, when you prune correctly yeah. at a point of growth where a leaf is, then it's the leaf that's there is naturally kind of hiding where you've yeah, cut. Okay. That makes sense. So we can, uh, now that's flowering plants. There are vase-shaped plants. Vase-shaped plants have a whole bunch of stems that come right at the base of the plant and come up. Yeah. Okay. Now they do have some other branches that are taller that you can prune, but majority of those you cut one third 
of the shoots that are coming up out of the ground. So you'll go in at the mm. base of the ground and cut one third of those out. Wow, okay. And you usually use the older ones, keep the newer ones. Okay. Uh, and you can tell by the color of the bark, whether they're no, new or old, and okay. the size of the bark. Gotcha. Um, well, there's a Florida anise that is a little bit out of control. Uh, but this is a little bit tall here. I, it, by taking the apical dominance of this particular branch out, we will force others below it to, to branch out, which will make this plant more full. And you don't have to prune much to, to, to stimulate that type of growth. And usually what I will do is I will stop and I will, when I get done and I think I'm done, I look back at it and say, you know, I don't like that. I think I want to go further. So I go to down to another point of growth. Okay. You learn to prune by pruning. You say, I don't like that. So I go to another point of growth. I don't like that. So I go down to another point of growth until I get the plant looking more round like I want it to and also this is going to force the lateral buds to, to come out and make it more full. Good stuff Joel, appreciate that. Okay, so we just finished pruning. Now I want to clean my pruners and disinfect them in case I need to prune something else. There, we've disinfected them. And um, if I hadn't oiled them before I started pruning, I would oil them again because you want to have a nice, easy grip and have it move very freely and not make a lot of noise so you know you've, it's oiled well. And then uh, to file them, you have to go with the, the blade and you just take a file, a metal file, and you file them. Make sure you've got a nice, sharp edge on this. And if you want to know if you've got a sharp edge, you should be able to cut a piece of paper. Let's talk about the benefits of snakes in the garden, because we always hear the bad, right? Oh yeah, well, Let's talk about the good. Well, of course there, there are a ton of benefits, but you know, no one feels neutrally about a snake, but, <laughs> but you just think about the hype and not the reality. Right. But they're an important part of the food web. You know, they eat all sorts of things. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this milk steak in, okay. in a minute, but uh, they're very uh, opportunistic feeders. You know, they will eat slugs, they'll eat uh, worms. As they get older, they'll start eating mice and rodents and all sorts of things. Uh, there are a variety of water snakes. Everyone focuses on water moccasins yeah. and such, but there are also a lot of other uh, uh, water snakes that live in and around the water that help uh, take out disease uh, fish out of fish populations huh. and help uh, thin the herd and kind of keep them on their toes, uh, as it were. But particularly in residential uh, uh, areas where we have upset nature, you know, we put in these like tame, uh, tame grass mm -hmm. uh, lawns and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, the food uh, chains and uh, food webs just get out of control. In particular, uh, that gets out of control in, in the way of rodents. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so it's, it's kind of interesting, the more you learn about snakes, uh, you more you learn how much you really need them around the house, but it also gives you some insight if you don't, if you're so afraid of snakes, you don't want the benefits, some ways to control them. Hmm. So for example, that snakes like uh, this one in an adult size that eat mice and rats and rodents and such, they, uh, you'll be shocked, but they like the same habitats as their prey animals. Hmm. And so if you've got an, uh, areas with tall grass, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, boards, flat pieces, uh, places to hide, uh, that, that foster the development of particularly uh, rodents and such, you're bound to have a lot of snakes because they a, like the same habitat uh, in general and they uh, uh, like the same habitat because there's a lot to eat. Sure. But with the mice and rats, just like uh, you know, uh, most of us give our um, uh, dogs and cats flea and tick preventatives, well, the, the mice don't get that. <laughs> and so, right. um, um, uh, so they're, they're uh, covered in fleas and ticks and that sort of stuff. And so uh, a side benefit of having healthy snake populations is that it helps keep the fleas and ticks under control. Interesting. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, there's wow. a study, uh, it's actually with a timber rattlesnake, which is a much larger snake. But uh, over the course of the year, by, uh, with the rodents it eat, it uh, consumed, uh, they, they counted between two and 4,000 ticks that were stuck to, to, uh, to wow. the mice. Hmm. 
a Haas enthusiast, uh, uh, how many people like bowls in their garden? Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Uh, right. Haas, right. You're exactly issue. right. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, uh, again, Haas is, you know, you, you typically have the mulch, which are yeah. like, uh, you know, Volv uh, highways and all like mm -hmm. that to get mm -hmm. uh, uh, to the, um, uh, 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 to the hostas and other delicious plants. Well, snakes <laughs> love that sort of stuff. Right. And so if you, when you have snakes in the, in the yard, well, uh, your vole population is gonna be under control. Right. There are native king snakes that actually, uh, uh, they're not as opportunistic. If, if they have a choice, they prefer uh, uh, meals and another snake. So uh, if you like snakes, that's you know, it's kind of plus or minus, but they are said to be immune from other snakes' venom. So if you don't like uh, uh, snakes like copperheads, which are fairly ubiquitous, uh, we don't have, uh, we have, in Tennessee has timber and pygmy rattlesnakes, but they typically are more uh, uh, rural sorts of snakes. Okay. They, don't, they don't like all the fuss that goes around the garden. But when you see snakes, uh, uh, it's always startling because you hear the stories, and no matter yes. how much you know, yes. you, you, your first thought is, is it venomous? Yes. You know, and of course, <laughs> there are a number of ways to tell. But whether it's venomous or non-venomous, anything with a bite can, uh, with a mouth can bite you. Sure. So just you know, just, just just look at it, and if you see it first, just take three steps back and walk away. You know, yeah. it's pretty easy. I feel like a, a broken record though at work. I'm you know, I, I tell people of all ages, you know, what to do when you see a snake. Take three steps or any animal you don't know. Take three steps back and and, and walk away. But apparently, it's really hard to say that enough. <laughs> um, uh, 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 right before you asked me to come on, uh, in the month of May, there are not one but two national news articles yeah. about people that just, you know, just had to go touch them. Yeah, picking uh, them up. Yeah, those are good stories. Uh, oh. Snake bites are relatively rare. And, uh, you know, there's a relatively low instance of being bitten. 40% uh, of most snake, uh, 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 venomous snake encounters where someone get bitten involve someone handling them. Sure. And forty percent of those people are frequently alcohols involved. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's it's, uh, it's really a, if you got to drink and, and walk around, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's an especially a good time. It's sort of like drinking it. and driving. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't drink and handle snakes. Yeah, they're right. really it's surprisingly <laughs> few combinations where that's a yeah. good uh, that's a good element. But there's a. Uh, uh, a uh, guy in Alabama who mm. picked up what he thought was a harmless milk snake. Picked it up. And he let his uh, kids examine it, and uh. he was going to save it for his brother. Wow. Um, uh, so uh, uh, it, clearly he didn't get the message about not backing up. Mm. But they are similarly marked. And one thing I do have to say, this happened in Alabama, but we're not part of the natural range of coral snakes. That uh, was a coral snake. Uh, but it, he, it was yeah. a coral snake. I brought a replica of a, a coral snake. Mm -hmm. And you can see they had the same warning color, mm -hmm. uh, colors, you know, the red, the black, and the yellow. Uh, there are all sorts of rhymes. Uh, uh, once again, if you have to remember a nursery rhyme, you know, was it red on black, friend of Jack, friend of Jack uh, red right. on yellow can kill, kill a fellow. Yeah, I remember those. But, <laughs> but, but actually, my personal favorite uh, way to remember it is that if red, uh, red and yellow are the colors on the stop sign. And so even if oh. you're just tempted, you know, mm -hmm. just, uh, just stop on that. But as an extra bonus today, I brought you each a, uh, a, a coral snake reminder. Ah, how about <laughs> uh, that? that uh, <laughs> <laughs> cool. That's, that's uh, adorable. Right. Yeah, and, and as you notice, it, it's really not, this re replica gives you a better idea of right. the, how the okay. actual bands and mm -hmm. all, uh, all appear. But you can see that the, the red touches the yellow, uh -huh. and that's a good uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, thing to remember. Pretty cool. But even after you killed a snake, uh, you know, a lot of people just their instinct is just to chop the head off. Another national uh, news article I brought, it was in the New York Times last week, and it sounds like fake news, but it's real. Someone in Texas chopped the head off a rattlesnake, and so he severed uh. it, 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 it in two, but he, he had to pick up the head. You uh. know, what could go wrong? Uh, uh, yeah, what, uh. <laughs> well, the answer is, is that they have a really uh, bite reflex that is super strong and persists for up to an hour after, after they're- Amazing. After you chop the head off. Amazing. Uh, but uh, it, you know, but I, I don't know why he picked, yeah, felt well, the need to pick it up. Well, or, or you know, I have to say that's kind of fair. It was sort of revenge for the <laughs> <Yeah>. snake. <laughs> hopefully the consequences weren't quite as dire for the human. Well, actually they, they were because most snakes conserve their venom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if you get bitten by a juvenile or baby snake, they don't know how to control the venom, but they want it to last. But that's, did it kill him? No, then but, it's not as dire. No, no, it's, it, it's not as dire, but 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 it, requ it, it required something like three or four times the amount of antivenom wow. than it uh, than it would have originally uh, taken, uh, because uh, the snake was it was just a bite reflex, and sure. so when the snake bit, it ejected uh, oh, uh, no. uh, uh, or, or, a, lot. Or, or a lot of the venom. Mm -hmm. 
Um, oh, uh, interesting stuff, Andy. And, and while we're talking about snake bites, well, guess who got oh, bitten by a snake? Well, can, can you share with us? I did. Um, your and I, I, luckily, I knew the uh, percentages that the mortality rate is like 0.001%, and so I was never afraid. I did a lot of research afterwards, and it turns out that. Um, I did a lot of the wrong things, like I had to walk back to the house. I was well down in a valley and had to go back up to the hill. But um, it was really not, and I was never afraid that it was going to be fatal because the only people that usually die from copperhead bites are those who have anaphylactic shock. Mm. So if you live for a few minutes. And the other thing I learned that I think is very important, we were always told to kill the snake and bring it with you so yeah. you could know mm. what kind. And now I know that you don't, yeah. and I didn't anyway, I didn't ever ever consider killing the beautiful copperhead that bit me. Mm -hmm. But they use the same type of antivenom no matter what the poisonous snake is here in Tennessee because it's, it's going to be the same kind. They're all hemotoxins. Yes, it's the very same one. So don't kill the snake and bring it and certainly don't risk any more damage by sure. trying to catch mm -hmm. and kill the snake because it's not going to matter once you get to the hospital. And even whether or not you get any venom is a judgment call. Wow. Uh, and you didn't kill the snake. I want no, to no, that. I admired yeah. the snake. Yeah. He was there first. Right. Um, I really, the only okay. real lasting damage he did is that I feel like um, I'm a little more cautious now, sure. and I used to be oblivious, which I enjoyed. Yeah. All right. So. Well, Andy, we appreciate that information. That was good stuff. Oh, well, thank you. Appreciate that education about snakes. A lot yeah. of stuff I didn't know before, I know now. That's right. So don't handle the snake, folks. All right? <laughs> yeah. Three steps back, you'll be just fine. Thanks again, Andy. You're welcome. All right. There's lots of different mulches you can use on tomato plants. And what we're gonna do here is we're actually gonna use newspaper, which is a really cheap mulch and has some advantages. So uh, the first thing we're gonna do, I tend to use two layers of newspaper. It makes it last the whole season since it does break down through the year. Um, to get it around your plants, it's nice because you can just rip it how you want it to be and just kind of tuck it around the base of the plant. If it's windy at all, the one downside of putting this out is you have to weigh it down. So we're gonna put down some, some dirt clods here just temporarily to hold it so it doesn't blow away. Then you just continue spreading it out. The way to really get it to stay down is just to water the paper. And that'll just get it wet, kind of get it to stick to the dirt. Now this plant is mulched, it was free. You can go to your local grocery store and just pick up the free paper and use that. And you should be good to go. This should last about one season. When you're done, you just till it back into the ground. So Q&A segment, you ready? I'm ready. We got some good questions here. Yes, we do. All right, here's our first viewer email. What fungicide can I use to prevent Phytophthora leaf blight on my peonies? I have it every year and do not know what to treat it with. I have already replanted to improve drainage. And this is Donna from Eads, Tennessee. So okay. she's already done the one thing that I thought of, right, which is to improve the drainage. Right. What else do we think? Well, you know, they might still be crowded and mm -hmm. they need air circulation. That, you know, maybe she needs to divide them and, and space them apart a little more. Okay. She could do that. Um, if not, you know, one thing, it's going to be not only on the stems, the roots, it's, it's also in the soil around right. it. So um, you can spray at the bases of the plants with a, a fungicide, Manquazeb and Maneb, okay. either of yeah. those. Yeah, and both of those um, are copper-based Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and it's every seven to 10 days. Right, right. But that could get tiring for a long time. Could a lot. Um, yeah, so, she, but you know, treat the soil too around, surrounding the plant. Okay. Because it, the disease lives there too. Okay. Yeah, but improving, improving that drainage was definitely good. But that yeah, was an excellent was idea. Good. That was good. But she's just gotta do a little bit more. Okay, yeah, so. Mancozeb, Manib, which is, you know, which are carpet-based fungicides. There's one, chlorothionyl, which is dacanil yeah. that you can use, but read and follow the label on all Definitely. that, if you're gonna use that, but we, we, we think you're, you're there. You're getting you're close. You're almost there. All right, here's our next viewer email. Can you identify these flowers? I've looked through several guides and can't find anything just like them. This is Rick in Corinth, Mississippi. So how about that? Yeah. So yeah, a little ID, those uh -huh. flowers. So what do we think those are? Well, they look like asters, asters right. and I, I'm wondering when the picture was taken. Okay. You know, because it doesn't say when it was taken. Oh, right, right. But because right. most of the asters that look like that bloom in the fall, so okay. I was wondering if 
what time of year it was. Sure. But they do. They look like asters. Yeah, asters, yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of rem reminds Pretty. me of the ones that you planted for us before. Yes. Yeah, just similar. Uh-huh. Okay. So there you have it, Ray. Asters. Okay. All right. Here's our next viewer email. Can or should you prune or trim Japanese maples, especially if branches are touching the house? This is Ms. Barber from Atoka, Tennessee. That's down by your way as well. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Can or should you prune a trim those Japanese sure maples that are touching can. the house? Yes, <laughs> sure you can. Yeah, just cut them back from the house. Again, to a point of growth. Another branch that's coming out or a leaf. Okay. So just cut them back to one of those points. Okay, so you could do that. Yes. Now, is it a any time, time of the year? So it yeah, can be any, any time, time of the year. year. Uh -huh. Okay. So there you go, Miss Barbara. You can do that. Tell her, don't be, don't be nervous, right? No, just it's get okay. in there, just cut it back, right? Uh -huh. To the point of growth. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Mr. Joella. It's fine, as always. It was good. All right, yes. thank you much. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org. And the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. If you would like more information on shrub pruning or snakes in the garden, go to familyplotgarden.com. We have links to helpful extension publications that you can print and take into your garden. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.